that, JP, it's up to you. Okay, great. I guess no pressure, right? Uh, having a very interesting CV is usually code for you're very old because it's given you the opportunity to collect that CV. But let me tell you a little bit about my background to contextualize some of what I'll talk to you about. By training, I'm a data scientist, a mathematician, and a psychologist. My first PhD is in psychology, the second's in mathematics. But I've been working with data and what is now known as data science for a very, 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 very long time. And in fact, I will encourage you, please, if you've been doing this longer than me, to raise your hand because I learned to code on an IBM 1620 with Hollerith punch cards when it was a relatively new machine. I've been doing this stuff, yes, since the 1960s. Anyone who wants to tell me that I look terrific for my age, I will take it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my grandchildren do not agree. Uh, <laughs> My grandchildren continuously torment me about how old grandpa really is. They want to cut me open and count the rings. I've been doing this truly for a very long time, and I've had the unique opportunity to gain some perspective because in my current role now, and I don't know though I have a current role, uh, I've been, uh, just yesterday someone referred to me as the Anthony Bourdain of AI, and I don't know how to take that, uh, especially since I'm hoping fewer suicidal ideations, but. Uh, that's what I do now. I, I sit on a number of boards, but I wander around the world talking about these things. I am next month, I will be everywhere from Australia to Azerbaijan. I have become, uh, one, I, I guess, the person who speaks for the machines. Uh, I uh, have had, uh, uh, gosh, I can't tell you how many conference presentations, how many interviews I've done. I do quite a bit of writing right now, so if uh, you follow me, some of you know me, I'm sure because uh, I, I, I get acerbic, mean-spirited comments from some of you. Thank you, I appreciate that. They match what I tend to write. Uh, I do a lot of the writing now on LinkedIn, though I'm being courted to do a column now that will tentatively be titled Observations of a Myopic Futurist. And that's what I'm gonna talk to you about. Uh, I actually don't like the idea of futurism. And in fact, please ask me again what I think will be happening in 50 years, because I'd love to be talking about that in a few minutes. but. Professionally, my background is also rather unusual. I started out as team leader of a scout sniper recon team with the United States Special Forces, and so I was a Special Forces soldier. So you will laugh at my jokes, because I can come get you still. Uh, but over the last few years, working backward, currently I sit on the board of several companies, uh, several fairly large companies, including Reimagine Holdings, which is a fairly large Holdings Group, we invest in a number of companies. We have either acquired or invested in, uh, I think we have about 14, 15 companies in the portfolio right now. Uh, I just saw, no kidding, a tweet come out today that we had acquired another that I was unaware of and I'm on the board, and so I'm kind of wondering how that happened. Uh, that'll be another conversation tomorrow. But uh, I also serve as a senior advisor to a number of large organizations uh, until recently, until a year ago, November, I was working with government, uh, <laughs> no longer. I've made an ideological choice. Uh, prior to doing this work, though, most recently, I was the chief data officer for Time, Inc., where I was also on the executive committee, the uh, helping to run this Fortune 50 company. Prior to that, I was the chief data scientist for Samsung. Prior to that, I spent about a decade working with the U.S. intelligence community. I was primarily reporting to the Director of National Intelligence, Admiral James Clapper, and we'll get back into that, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on, but I am the guy you heard about who built a lot of those capabilities initially to ensure that another 9-11-like event wouldn't happen by being able to coordinate information, data, and exchange it more effectively among the various 18 agencies within the U.S. intelligence community. But then they changed our remit once we were successful at that, and we ended up hunting. And so we were the guys who went out and looked for bad guys all over the planet. And so I sort of went from there in data science all the way to Time Inc. So you could say I spent the first part of my career as a data scientist looking for serial killers, and the last part looking for people who really like serial. And it turns <laughs> out it's all the same thing. Uh, it's the same math, it's the same data, it's the same everything. And I thought about just talking to you guys about that, and if you'd like, I would be happy to get into an argument about whether, what are the advantages of particle swarm optimization versus a stochastic gradient descent model. You will make my day. We can talk about that all we like, 
But what I thought I might do instead is give you the advantage of perspective of somebody who has had the opportunity as a consequence of years, so depth and breadth, and seeing how AI and machine learning and data science is done right, and how it's more often done very, very, very wrong in organizations, and what you can learn from that to be able to do it more effectively for yourselves in your career. Sound fair? Good. So, given that I'm a grandpa, and grandpas love telling stories, let's start with a story. Let's pretend. It's September 4th, 1882. You are working in, at the tip of Manhattan. In fact, not just downtown Manhattan, specifically you're working on Wall Street. More specifically, you're working at 11 Wall Street, the home of the New York Stock Exchange. The building has only been there for a bit over a dozen years. About four years ago, they put this new invention of telephones into the building. But remember, this is a time where buildings are heated by coal and lit by lanterns, and the primary mode of transportation is fueled by hay, and don't get me started on the exhaust. So this is a very different time than we're living in right now. But on this particular day, September 4th, 1882, everything's about to change. Why? Because a few blocks away, on Pearl Street, where it intersects Fulton, a young entrepreneurial inventor by the name of Edison is about to flip a switch and light up one square mile of lower Manhattan. And in doing so, he's going to electrify the world. Now imagine what it would have been like to be there when that's happening. We know because we have a contemporaneous account from the New York Times, they actually wrote up the story, witnessing it as it was occurring. But imagine, more importantly to our conversation, what it would have been like if you were here. If you were in Hoboken, still stuck in the dark, and looking toward the light. That's what we're seeing right now with AI. That's what we're seeing right now with machine learning, with data science. A select handful of companies are actually operationalizing, actioning on, and occasioning real results from these capabilities. But to quote the future novelist William Gibson, the future is already here, but it's just not evenly distributed. It turns out that these capabilities are now increasingly becoming available to all of us and they are fundamentally going to change the world. When I talk to different organizations, particularly when I talk to CEOs and board members, they want to know, is this just a bunch of hype and hyperbole and nonsense and the current BS? Is this real or is this just the new thing that we're talking about today? And I'm here to tell you it is absolutely real. These things are happening and happening at a pace and a precedence we can't believe, and it's all happening because of three things. In fact, if we're gonna talk about threes, let's talk about three different threes during the course of the day, so three will become the theme. Let's start with the first three things. The first three things, size, speed, and smarts. What do I mean by size? Size is the amount of data available to us. By 2020, just a year and a half from now, it's estimated that there will be about 40 zettabytes of data available to us. Does anyone have any idea what 40 zettabytes really is? I didn't either, but I'm a mathematician and a geek, so I had to figure it out. Here's 40 zettabytes. If you were to count every grain of sand on planet Earth, multiply it by 75, that's 40 zettabytes. That's how much data we're talking about an incalculable amount, an amount that's unimaginable to all of us. Speed. Intel just put out their Core i9 processor. The Core i9 processor operates, which by the way, you can get right now for a thousand bucks and throw it in a laptop, and the entire machine ends up costing you about 1,500 bucks, 1,600. It operates at one teraflop, which is, does anyone know? A, a flop floating operation per second. A floating operation per second is, um, there's someone who's smart, uh, 237.3256 times 537.3329 is, it would take him a second and we don't want to wait, but let's assume he could solve that problem in one second. One second he could solve it and another second he could solve another and another and another and another, just like that. On and on and on, never needs to take a rest. How long would it take him to solve a teraflop, one trillion of those problems? 
13,700 years. But wait, there's more. Because Google couldn't let anything just be that. And so what did they do? They made the TPU. And the TPU, the TensorFlow Processing Unit, all due respect to those GPUs we were talking about, which replaced the CPUs, now we have the TPU. And the TPUs are operating at 180 teraflop. But wait, better still, Google is now consolidating them into a pod, 64 of them, which combine to 11.2 petabytes. At 11.2 petabytes, to solve that same number of problems, one every second, would take our smart friend 365 million years. It can be solved in one second. So when we talk about data and we talk about speed, right, when we're talking about the size and the speed, now that's really what we're talking about. But what's really changing everything is the final S, that's the smarts, the algorithms. The algorithms, many of them we rely on today, have been around with us even before I started. Back in the 1940s, 1943, McCullough and Pitts came up with the perceptron neuron, which is truly, despite what Marvin Minsky wanted to say otherwise, become the foundation of pretty much everything we're doing in machine learning and neural networks, certainly in deep learning. This is the foundation of it all. All of this has coalesced and come together, not even in the last 10 years, five years, two years, six months. These things are evolving a pace that we can't even believe. The other gentleman before me was referring to AlphaGo. Here's the story you probably don't know about AlphaGo. Go, those of you who play, and hopefully a lot of you do, Go is to checkers what checkers is to tic-tac-toe in levels of complexity. That's why we thought it, while we didn't think it was an intractable problem, we thought it was a far away problem. We thought it was one we wouldn't get to for quite some time. Not only did AlphaGo learn to play Go better than any human in the world, it learned in concert with another human. It learned by working with the European champion, his game got better as he helped train the machine, as the machine got better. The machine that went on to play Lee Sedol, who was the world's leading player at Go, four games out of five. But wait, there's more to the story. The part most of us don't talk about is a few weeks after AlphaGo beat Lee Sedol, AlphaGo was taken and put on a shelf and we started a new one we, they referred to as AlphaGo Zero. AlphaGo Zero wasn't given any of the advantages of AlphaGo. It was just given the rule book. And incidentally, in most Asian countries, you learn to play Go when you're about five or six. This is a very simple game to learn. Very complex to play, very simple rules, very simple to learn. They taught this machine the rules. That's all they gave it, and they let it play AlphaGo Zero. After 100 hours of training, it was able to beat AlphaGo 1,000 games to zero. The machine learned from the machine. The machine became better iteratively as a consequence of engaging with itself, essentially. It learned to get better. They're learning to get better and better. The questions I'm hoping we'll get toward the end are what things will happen in 50 years, what is understanding, and if we have room and time, let's talk about bias because that's also worth attending to. To put all this in real context for you though, my friends at Intel ran a couple of numbers. Just on size and speed, they said, if you took the 1971 VW Beetle, which came out at the same time as Intel's first microprocessor, and you compared the evolution on a Moore's Law sort of a constant of this exponential growth to the VW, if it experienced the same kind of growth in capacity that the Intel microprocessor chip did, it would now be able to go 300,000 miles per hour, it would get two million miles per gallon, and it would cost four cents. <laughs> this is mind-blowing capacity. This is what's empowering, this is what's enabling what we're able to do today. There are, as a consequence of this, technology, doubtless going to be some extraordinary uh, innovations, some inventions that we can't even fathom, can't even imagine, which I'll take my mind of digression and say, what's going to happen 50 years from now? I don't know, 50 years ago, all efforts in the computational community were focused on a single event because 13 months later, on July 20th, 1969, they would finally put a man on the moon in the Apollo 11 capsule which had several million times less computing capacity than I carry on my hip. 
and so do all of you, by the way, which incidentally, how many of you, by show of hands, do not have a smartphone with you? I always like to see if there are Amish in the room. <laughs> no? Isn't that extraordinary? We all have millions of times more computing capacity than put men on the moon for the first time walking around with us. What sort of changes is that going to occasion? Could we have imagined and predicted? I, by the way, watched it in rapture. I sat there July 20th, 1969, watching men for the first time land on the moon. That was also the day that I got into this business. I was a little bit precocious. I was a little bit young still at the time. But that's when I started working with computers, on July 21st, 1969, because of that. I've gotten a front row seat to see how these things have changed. I fancy myself a little bit forward thinking. <laughs> Please. We're wearing Dick Tracy watches that I couldn't have imagined. I still remember vividly the first time I talked on a mobile phone <laughs> belonging to my brother and was the size of my head, well, bigger than my head, going down the street. We, we, lived in a t we live in a time now that's like nothing we could have imagined before, and we're going to see some of these inventions. But what I think is going to be most interesting are not the flying toasters and the laser-guided sharks. Those are all fine. I think it's going to be things like productivity. I think it's going to be things like letting us operate and work more efficiently. Forrester Research has come out and said, and I'm quoting here, businesses adopting AI, IoT, and big data will take $1.2 trillion from their less informed peers by 2020. US GDP is only $16.7 trillion. Can you even fathom what that means. Think about the advantages you have if you're one of the companies that's employing this technology, or worse, if you're one of the ones that are not. We all know the stories about Amazon and the warehouses and what they're doing with robot bots. Have you heard about JP Morgan? JP Morgan's COIN program, which is the worst acronym ever, ever it stands for Contract Investigation, though I'm never one to make fun of anyone for naming things. My dog's name is Dog. Uh, but what this does is it replaces the work formally done by loan officers and lawyers in sorting through boilerplate contracts and agreements. It is able to perform work that previously took lawyers and loan officers, wait for it, 360,000 hours it's able to do in a second. This is game changing. This is mine. What do you do if you're the competitor now? How do you not have those capabilities? How do you remain and stay competitive? We are going to see a shift in productivity like nothing we've ever seen before. I'm actually one of the articles I'm working on right now. Some of you, especially those of you with an economics background, will be familiar with what uh, Solo called the productivity paradox. I'm writing an article I'm referring to as the productivity paradox paradox because it turns out we have shifted this entirely. Productivity is now the most competitive edge that companies are going to be able to have. All that said, that's the bright side and the light. But what I really want to talk to you about for the rest of the time we have together is the dark and the night. Because it turns out, as history has taught us, and history, I think, uh, I tend to agree with Mark Twain, history may not repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. And one of the choruses that we've heard over and over again through history is major tech initiatives like this do not work. In fact, 84% of major tech initiatives fail in virtually all organizations. I've come to find that they fail for some very specific reasons. And if you want to avoid that failure, you need to adopt a very different lens. And so that's what I really want to focus on with you is what is it you think about and what is it I've thought about. When I got that call from Admiral Clapper, he called me at home on a Sunday. He was still undersecretary for intelligence, defense, I don't know, it went on for five pages. But this is before he was appointed DNI. And he called me at home, uh, I'll never forget, it was on a Sunday afternoon. And he says, look, you may have heard we had a little bit of an issue in DC, in Pennsylvania, at the Pentagon and in New York, uh, we're referring to it as 9-11. Yep, I heard of it. And we need to make sure that never happens again. The problem is, he told me, we had all the data. We had the information. We just didn't have access to it. We didn't know how to get to the information. And he explained to me and he talked to me and he told me a little bit about what was going on. 
And I told him, you know, Admiral, the challenge here is not a matter of technology. What you need here is not a technical, but a socio-technical solution, which in his inimitable style, he told me, well, why do you think we're calling you? As far as your records show, you're a geek, a shrink, and you still have your clearances. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Secret. So the Admiral told me, in, uh, uh, well, if you've seen Admiral Clapper interviewed on television, you know he's a man of few and straightforward words. Uh, I'll give you two choices. There's door A and door B. Door A is I can order your sorry self back in a uniform and bring you down to the beltway to fix this mess. Door B is I'll give you a really big bag of money. I went with door B. I went down to the beltway. We worked on this. We created these systems and not just focusing on the technology, but on systems we were able to integrate into sort of a human dimension. See, my work, I, I, I tend to talk about what I do, not as AI, but IA. Not artificial intelligence, but intelligence augmentation. How can we enable people to make more effective, better, faster decisions than they were otherwise able to do? And so we created systems that were able to do just that. We were fairly successful. We were actually recognized by Time Magazine, coincidentally, as one of the inventions of the year for 2003, which, by the way, is a sore spot with me. We were only on the list number 18. Uh, <laughs> he told us that because of the inventions we created, we avoided any future 9-11 level events, and it's only 18 on their list, which really ticked me off until I realized the Tesla Roadster was only number two. So I figured, all right, if you can't be, if the Tesla Roadster isn't number one, that's okay to lose out to A. After we did that is when they changed our remit and said, if you were effective doing this, can you also hunt for bad guys? And so a lot of my life has been looking for who's on the other side of the screen and trying to understand people as a consequence of the digital trail of detritus and data that they leave behind. And that's the work that I took with me to Samsung and to Time Inc. But the reason I digress and tell you the story is what is it we focused on? Well, I take a somewhat unusual lens to my work. I'm a data scientist, I'm a mathematician, but I'm also a shrink. And so what I look at is always data, people, and money. Data, people, and money. By data, here's what I mean. I always take into consideration the science, the mathematics, and the technology, what they're capable of. By business, I'm always looking at it through a lens of economics, of commerce, of exchange, of politics, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, of economics of business. When I talk about people, I look through the lens of psychology, sociology, and politics. You have to take this more dimensional lens to the work you do. So many of us, especially those of us who are trained specifically in the sciences, in the STEM, in mathematics, in data, in analytics, in computer science, we tend to take this sort of clockwork perspective to the world and look at it all as a machine and a tractable problem that we simply have to solve technologically. It always inevitably fails. We know that historically, with all due respect to SAP, ERP implementations and the failure rates are unholy and extraordinary. CRM, likewise. The biggest ones we ever saw, though, were from BPM, BPR, Business Process Reengineering. Those of you who might have lived through and survived some of this debacle that cost the American economy, some are estimating nearly $1 trillion. Michael Hammer ended up going on the front page of the Wall Street Journal and doing a mea culpa in which he said, and I quote here, we forgot about the people. I wasn't very smart about that. You have to be. You have to think about what are the human considerations of what you're doing, not just on your employees, on your customers, on society, on all dimensions. What is what you're doing? What will it do? And how will it impact the world? Once you have that lens, we come to our next three, which is you have to act. And by act, I think of the acronym ACT, alignment, capabilities, and the technology. Alignment. Far too often, we tend to implement AI, machine learning, data science solutions as if it's one size fits all. It's the same thing we do when we're installing a dishwasher or a washing machine. It doesn't work that way. 
The solutions have to be aligned and congruent with the goals and the strategy of the organization. They have to be in service to and in furtherance of what the organization is trying to achieve. If you're not aligned with the goals of your particular idiosyncratic needs in your organization, I absolutely guarantee you, you'll fail. C is capabilities. Do the people have what they need to succeed? Do they have the tools, the resources, the knowledge? Do the staff have the knowledge, skills, and abilities to be able to do this sort of work? Our friend from SAP had made the point, and I couldn't agree more, it isn't a miracle to build a data scientist. We can impart and we can teach these skills. By the way, those of you who don't know, we keep blithely using some of these terms like machine learning. Anyone here uncomfortable with, tell the truth, what machine learning really is? Is this just a term? Okay. Do you want to learn machine learning in about 30 seconds? There we go. This is the truth. Those of you who are machine learning experts, argue with me if you like. Incidentally, let's first ask, can everybody code? <coughs> who in the room can? <coughs> Excuse me, can code? <coughs> Ugh, need some water. Um, do you mind? I'm going to borrow some of your water. Uh, Thank you. You can. But yeah, I'm that's all right. <coughs> I'm former military. OK. Ah. Uh, there you go. Thank you. Uh, I've had worse. OK. Uh, those of you who can't code, ready? Um, if, then, do, while, else, Booleans. OK, those of you who code, did I just cover 90% of coding? OK, you want to learn the SQL query language? Select from where Booleans. Got it? Good. With five minutes, I'm not kidding, five more minutes, maybe 10, I could get you fluent in coding in virtually any language using SQL or machine learning. So here's machine learning. The way a traditional computing system works, we have data, we have rules, we put those into the machine, and it comes out with answers. Data, follow these rules, <laughs> answers. Data, rules, answers. Machine learning, flip these two. Data, answers, give me the rules. That's it. That's machine learning. I kid you not. All you're doing is you're giving it lots and lots of data, lots and lots of examples of what you're looking for, and it's deriving the rules for you. We could get into the particulars and the specifics. It would take a whole 10 minutes. I actually do quite a bit of writing on this. I've made it a challenge to myself. Rather than being able to explain these in articles, I've delimited myself to 1,300 characters in a post on LinkedIn. I've taught everything from the fundaments of mathematics and set theory to just last week, I was talking about uh, image recognition using deep learning algorithms <laughs> in 1,300 characters. This stuff is not that complicated. The essential ideas are really what we have to convey and communicate. That's the C, is communicating those capabilities cogently, coherently, so that people can able to understand what it is we do. And the T, again, is that focus on technology. That's where we really have to spend our time. One of the things you have to realize is if you're in this business, like it or not, you are also a change agent. You are introducing people to things that are going to scare them, that are going to change the way they see the world. That becomes part and parcel of the job. We tend to blindly think that all we have to do is build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to our door. It doesn't work that way. We have to explain to them, convince them, cajole them, get them to buy into the ideas we have. You know, I'm a shrink. I only know one psychologist's joke. How many shrinks does it take to change a light bulb? Just one, but it has to want to change. I didn't say it was a good joke. I know, it's a groaner. But that's what we have to do. We have to get them to want to. So how do we do that? Another upcoming article, and I'll give you the preview. I've reduced everything you even need to know about human motivation and being able to persuade someone and change their mind into five forces, which I can explain in 25 words, I think. But here are the five forces. Hope and anger, love and fear, and I haven't decided what to call that middle one, but I refer to it as either need, want, or greed. You kind of know what I mean, right? Hope and anger, love and fear, want, need, and greed. Reduced to a sentence, people will do anything for love. And they'll do anything if you give them hope, justify their anger, allay their fears, 
or tell them how to get what they really want. That's it. It turns out that's everything. If you want to be able to motivate someone to be able to engage in a behavior, that's what you do. What do shrinks do? What do psychologists do? I actually am trained as a clinical psychologist. I did quite a bit of work in social psychology. I practice sort of the dark arts of psychology, right? I worked with CIA for a couple of years and I did work on elicitation, which is uh, trying to get people to share information with you voluntarily. I taught that program for CIA. Um, all psychologists, it turns out, do the same thing. We describe, understand, predict, and influence behaviors. Influence behaviors, which is a nice way of saying we manipulate people, right? But so do all of you, and if you don't, your mothers do, right? Mothers are master manipulators, and frankly, I've spent years studying the one I married, uh, and my daughter and now my granddaughters, uh, who now manipulates me. So it's the circle of life kind of a thing, right? And I see how they do it and how they tug on their strings, and that's really what it's about. We need to be able to move and manipulate and motivate people's behaviors effectively, and that's incumbent on us. We tend to abrogate that responsibility and say it's up to us to build the machines and the technology and the solutions, and it's up to the C-suite to change how people think about those things. Nothing could be further from the truth. One of the great experiences I've had was, as a matter of fact, when I was at Time Inc., I was chief data officer, but I was also a member of the XCOM, the folks who were running this company. And so I got to be part of that C-suite to see what the 15 people running this company were talking about. And it's never the technology. It's almost always about the people. It's almost always about what levers do we pull, what things do we do, how do we get people to be able to move. That's a lot of the conversations I have now with the boards that I meet with. What you need to do if you want to change an organization is you have to act and you have to encourage a sense of urgency. You know, um, I think we have time for one more quick story. <coughs> I was, uh, when I was going through training in the military, I don't tell a lot of military stories. I don't tell any stories from the field. I, we leave that to the SEALs. The SEALs tell all the stories. Yeah, we have a different ethos. We, we never tell anything from mission. But I will tell you about training. And so uh, one of the training programs I went to was to learn how to jump out of a perfectly good airplane, which don't know why this should take a lot of training, but it actually does. It takes weeks and weeks and weeks to learn how to just ah, jump into space. And so we, I volunteer for, and you have to volunteer, but I was part of special forces, so you were, you know, volunteered, right? And so I went to airborne school to learn to be a paratrooper. All paratroopers for the US military, all branches, all learn at the same place. You go to Fort Benning at a place called Fry Field. And Fry Field is where they give all the training, they give all the lectures, they have all the jump towers and the planes and all that sort of thing. Your first day there, they put you through, like every military school, safety briefings. And so the first day of airborne school, now we're gonna take morons who were stupid enough to sign up for this and throw them out of airplanes. Safety's a prime consideration. And so they spend some real time lecturing us. And so we're going from briefing to briefing to briefing. Finally, it's the last briefing of the day. It's about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, 1600, see, uh, in Georgia, Fort Benning, Georgia, baking sun, middle of August. And we're sitting there in an outdoor bleat amphitheater. <laughs> Actually, a configuration disturbingly like this. And <laughs> Sergeant Airborne himself comes up to the stage. Never met him yet, he's the head black hat. And so he comes up and this guy's got this big barrel chest and a voice that sounds like he gargles with barbed wire and he says, gentlemen, this piece of equipment is your reserve parachute. In the event your primary chute does not deploy, this piece of equipment may save your life. And so now we're all awake, figuring this could be good information. This, the following is how you operate the reserve parachute. Should your chute not deploy, and for some reason this never occurred to me before, so now I'm thinking, wait a minute, if the, but no. If the, reserve, if the primary chute does not deploy, you must grasp the D-ring firmly in your right hand, pull quickly, the chute will deploy, you will float safely down to earth. Should the chute not deploy, <laughs> 
You must pull it on the risers, the strings, very quickly, <laughs> gather up the silk, throw it firmly down and to your left. The chute will then deploy, you will float safely to Earth. Should the chute still not deploy, <laughs> you must pull in the risers quickly, gather the silk, and throw it down and continue to repeat this until the chute deploys. Dead silence. One guy about three rows up behind me finally says, Sergeant Airborne, how long do we have to get that chute to deploy? Look at him, he says, the rest of your life, son. The rest of your life. You talk about AI and organizations, machine learning. How long do you have to do this stuff and to get the, your act together and start to implement on some of this? The rest of your corporate life. Those are all the formal comments. I wanted to leave time to answer some of your questions. Thank you very much.